tekrar günaydın hepinize. Öncelikle gerçekten geniş katılımlar için çok teşekkür ediyoruz. Bu bizim için aslında ilk defa böyle bir organizasyon gerçekleştiriyor. Tüm müşterilerimizin katılımıyla. Gerçekten zaman ayırıp geldiğiniz için, katıldığınız için çok teşekkür ederiz. Bugün aslında iki nedenle bizim için oldukça önemli bir gün. Bunlardan birincisi dediğim gibi sizlerin ilk defa böyle bir organizasyonda birlikte çalıştığımız müşterilerimizle bir arada olmak. Bu nedenle bu vesileyle hepinize gerçekten bugüne kadar şirketimizde olan desteğiniz, yakın iş birliğiniz nedeniyle çok teşekkür ediyorum. İkinci neden e, bugünle ilgili e, bildiğiniz gibi 15 yıldır kuruluşumuzdan beri DDI'yı Türkiye ve Türkiye Cumhuriyetlerinde temsil ediyoruz. DDI'nin kurucusu Bill Bay'ın bugün bizlerle birlikte. Bill'in özellikle e, DDI'nin kurucusu olması dışında hakikaten insan kaynakları yönetiminde birçok ülkelere imza atmasıyla bu kişiliği daha çok tanınıyor. Bugüne kadar assessment center e, uygulamalarının dünyada öncülüğünü yapması, yine bildiğiniz gibi dünyada en kullanılan iş alım, davranış bazlı iş alım sistemi olan target selection'ın geliştirilmesi, yine dünyada ilk defa davranış bazlı liderlik gelişim programı olan interaction management'ın geliştirilmesi gibi birçok ülkelere e, imza atmış bir kişi. Ayrıca 25 tane kitap var. Bunların içerisinde belki de sizlerin de okuduğunuz Zep gibi, Heroes gibi birçok iş dünyasında bestseller olmuş kitabı var. Hatta Zep biraz önceki e, konuşmalarımız sırasında paylaştı. 3,5 milyon adet satmış bütün dünyada. Birçok yine e, insan kaynakları alanında ödülü var. Ben sözü daha fazla uzatmadan tekrar katılımınız için çok teşekkür ediyorum ve alkışlarınızla bir bayım sahneye davet Well, uh, good morning. I can't tell you how happy I am to be uh, here with you this morning. I've had the most wonderful adventure so far around Turkey. I've been here several times, but never on a business trip. I've always come just to enjoy myself. And uh, now I'm, I'm enjoying myself and being here on business. So that's a good combination. Uh, I'm going to talk to you about the leadership imperative, and that means the, the ne necessity of growing more leaders faster. And I think uh, Tensel may have mentioned to you that uh, I uh, had a book that uh, I, I and two other people wrote uh, 10 years ago about growing your own leaders. And that was the big thing then, that uh, you, how, how are we going to get ready for the retire in America? We had a lot of people retiring and how were we going to have the replacements for those people. And uh, then, uh, so 10 years have passed, and we still have problems <laughs> with growing leaders, getting enough good people in the organization. And, but now, everybody wants it to do it faster, because uh, they haven't done it when they should have, because these things take time, right? And so how do you develop people at all levels of the organization faster? And that's the part, that's my new book, that I have to admit I thought I was going to come with my book and give it to you all. But when, when you write books, you know that they don't, never come out on time. <laughs> so we're a little bit delayed on that. Uh, but uh, so what I'm doing is giving you a, a piece of the book of uh, what's going to be in the book. Uh, and uh, so it'll, you can decide whether you want to read it after that. Uh, but anyway, I've got a uh, agenda here. Uh, 
the, I'm going to talk about the need to develop leadership talent and then what we think is how you do it, very briefly. Uh, then uh, how do you tie leadership development to the drivers of the organization? That's going to be a big thing that I'm going to talk about. How do you, so, you know, a lot of HR people have just developed people for the sake of it. We all know you need leadership, so let's put people through leadership. Let's put people through this training program or that training program uh, that are good for them. But how do you pick the training programs that will have the most impact for your organization? That's what we're going to talk about a lot. Uh, and then how to uh, develop uh, high potentials, particularly. Uh, and then something about a learning journey, which is, again, a way to really make training work. And uh, then uh, ending up with something that everybody, in America anyway, is interested in, is how do you identify high potentials to know who to put your money on, who to develop. And we're going to end with that, and we're going to have a discussion. But I would absolutely love for you to ask me questions during my presentation. Love it. And if you don't understand something or you want me to give an example, I'm full of examples <laughs> of, of these things. And so if you could just, if you just wave a hand or do, please, we, I'd like to make it an interactive kind of presentation. First, I, I've got a test for you. Uh, the, uh, uh, the conference board, which is an association of businesses uh, around the world, uh, did a study this year in 2013 where they asked the CEOs what their biggest challenges are. What, what do they worry about at night, okay? And uh, he, the, he, they gave them about 15 or 20 of these challenges that they could choose from. And these were the top challenges that were chosen. And who would like to, to guess what was the number one challenge? What? Innovation. No, no, what? Innovation. No, innovation. Innovation, she said. Right. But that was last year. <laughs> <laughs> Russ, it was. The, the number one last year, but not this year. So what, what do you think it is this year? I think, I think well, I'll tell you what it is. <laughs> it's, it's human capital. But that's not true everywhere. Uh, because in, I'll show you. Uh, in Asia, it's number one. Uh, but it's only number five in the United States. And you, that, if you, you mathematical people will wonder how it averages to be number one if the United States is number five, and that's because I didn't show you Europe and South America and things, and so in all those places it's human capital. Uh, <coughs> the, uh, <coughs> but why, that's an interesting thing, I think, about, uh, so in, in Asia, which is primarily India, China, uh, uh, why is it number one and, and number five in the United States? I, I really don't know, and they, these are close. They're not big differences, but, uh, but in, I go to China a lot, and the big issue is they're growing, they, uh, there's a lot of strain in it. They are retiring a lot of people too because in these big companies in Asia, they hired, they started the people not at when they were 20. There were a lot of people 40 or 50 who started in and now they're all retiring. And so uh, that's it. If you, if you have, if, if you want to meet the organization's challenges, that uh, human capital uh, is probably the big thing. Uh, in China, this is, then, then they ask them, uh, why? What, what about human capital 
uh, makes you choose that? And these are what they answered. So that's sort of what you would, would, would you answer the same thing? Would that, is that pretty common? Does anybody have any, any other thing that they worry about in the human capital part? So then what's happening in America is that uh, number one is operational excellence because we're worrying about competition and we're worrying about can we uh, keep our products extremely good and, and that. Uh, and uh, the number two is government regulations where uh, we uh, are getting more and more of that uh, in the United States. So now, why am I telling you this? I'm telling you this because what's important to CEOs changes. And if I have one theme of what I'm going to talk to you about today, it is that HR has to be with the CEOs. So when they start to worry about this, then you adapt your programs and things to provide information in people that are in that area. And so I want one more here is, uh, uh, here's a new McKinsey uh, study. Those other ones were uh, conference board. Uh, it, you, they ask, what's the critical priorities of in the human capital business? And number one is retention, uh, next door practically strategic work planning, workforce planning, and employee engagement. And we see that engagement never quite gets to the top on these lists, but it's on every list. That how do you engage, how do you get people to own their job, to feel a sense of responsibility, to be happy in their job, and so you're gonna see that uh, everywhere. Okay, but uh, the big focus was for them leadership development and succession management because all over the world, people are trying to figure out who's going to, who's going to fill the new jobs, okay? So what does that translate to uh, in a study done by uh, DDI? Uh, only 38% of leaders report high confidence in their organization's leadership. So if you ask leaders uh, in the organization, from first level supervisors to middle managers, are you confident that your bosses and the other leaders in the organization are really great? Do you, do, are you, you, are you think they're as good as they can be? And only 38% say yes. In another study done by PwC, only 18% of leaders report sufficient fut future bench, bench strength. That's a way of saying that only 18% of the leaders think that there's enough good people coming up behind them to grow the organization in the way they want to grow. And in another McKinsey study where they looked at, talked to the chief financial officers, they report talent constraints are hampering innovation. One in three. Okay, and there's no wonder why that only six in 10 HR report companies report that future leadership development and succession planning efforts are unlikely to work. That is, more than half of the people don't think that their leadership development programs will work. More than half don't think that what you all are doing is going to be successful in giving the, your, giving the people to management that will move the organization. 66% uh, of leaders rate their own leadership development as low. So when you, uh, when you survey managers in all different kinds of companies and say, well, how about yourself? Did you get good leadership? Did, you, did they make you the best you can be? Did they 
you know, educate you and give you challenging jobs and move you as fast. Only 66% say that they are not satisfied with the development they're getting. And 60-60% of HR people report that there's no high potential program in place. They don't, they don't, we'll get into that, of course, but uh, that's pretty bad. And uh, two-thirds report that there's no assessment process. And you'll be hearing from me that if you can't assess them, if you can't figure out who you want to develop, because you can't develop everybody, then you're going to be wasting your money and you probably won't have a good enough program. Okay, now, it, well, I'm almost done with this part. Uh, that uh, th th These are very interesting studies where we looked at quality of, uh, of de management development. And we looked at uh, companies that were doing a good job of growing their own and supporting their management and companies that are doing a poor job. And then we looked at their financial information. And the, the good companies, the, co the good HR companies, the ones that we would like, they are seven times, they seven times better in business results. They are six times better in, in engagement. And they are 20 times better in retention. So that's the bottom line that you're going to get if you have a good development program for talent. So look at that. I mean, think of the money that you save by ha keeping people rather than going to other places. Why do people leave jobs? The overwhelm, I, I don't know in Turkey, but I assume that's the same, that people leave jobs because of bosses. They don't like their boss. Overwhelmingly, that's what we find all over the world. And if we can make those bosses better, if we can make them better leaders, think of the savings that would be. I mean, just huge. And uh, then if you look at, uh, here's another study. Uh, the, the better companies are 2.8 2 better in their financial results that they you know, give to the government and to the stock market. Customer satisfaction is five times better. Productivity higher, quality of service. So I, I just always hate to when I hear that, well, HR doesn't really do anything. HR makes people feel good. They, you know, it, that's not right. HR has a huge responsibility for the company that you, you can make a huge impact. And one of the things that you need to do is to be able to convince your bosses about that impact. And I'm going to give you some ideas. Okay, so uh, we uh, are going to talk about taking a strategic view of development. And rather than force you to read this, there's one in your book. So everybody should have in your folder a copy of this. Uh, I, I have often taken an hour to explain this, but, I, but we have such a very smart audience that I'm not going to try even. <laughs> I'm, I'm just going to hit the high points. Uh, but this was a system developed by DDI many years ago, and it is a synopsis of what we think is the relationship of uh, a talent management system. And so it starts out over here, uh, and you have the company has strategic priorities. That's you know this is what once a year the boss tells you what the 
priorities of the direction of the company, and there are cultural priorities. What, what do we need to do to be good citizens to their country and uh, in our business and things? And they, those things turn out, could turn into something called business drivers. And we're, I'm going to show you lots of examples of business drivers as we go through. But a business driver is basically your strategy. What do you want to accomplish this year? What do we have to do f to make the business succeed? Then you look at what kind of talent do we have? And we look at the kind of talent we need. We're going to have to expand. We have to hire people. What's, do we have the right organization? Uh, what's the trends in outside the world in, with talent? And then we, what kind of gaps do you find? Where are the holes in that? And then you want to grow the talent. And then you have something called a success profile, which I'll show you in a minute. And then everything is built around that. That's the key thing, that you need to have a list of competencies that you build your succession management around, your selection around, your development around, and your performance management. I, I wrote articles about that before most of you were born, I guarantee you. Uh, uh, it was a new thing about 50 years ago, uh, and, uh, uh, and we still don't have people doing it. So we have companies all over who hire with one set of competencies and develop on another set of competencies and appraise on another set of competencies, and it's a huge waste, uh, and obviously. And then that turns out to better workforce performance and business impact. The point is that the business drivers should uh, make or drive the success profile. And if you could read it, this is better. Uh, and this is what the success profile is, where it's, because when you think about a person, what do you want to know about that person that, relative to a job, right? And so you want to know what kind of experience they have. Uh, what kind of competencies they have, and you, if you, I know you know, but I'll be showing you about that, uh, and what kind of knowledge, about knowledge of the company, knowledge of, of uh, like if you need a, a lawyer, that kind of knowledge, and then who am I are the personality attributes of the person. And we feel that we need all four of those, and that one of the big mistakes that companies make is that you don't focus enough on all of them. Some people just look at experience. You know, he's been in a job for, he's been a salesperson for 20 years, and I'm trying to fill a sales job. He must be good. That does not mean he must be good at all. But uh, uh, you have to, it's, you have to look at be beneath that, and so what we, we DDI focuses its uh, attention to those areas, but the big difference is where. So for, let me say one thing: before we get started on finding people who are going to be high potential in the organization, we want to look at certain areas of experience certain air personal attributes, certain co competencies that we will know will relate to the job. And what we used to do, this is the big difference. I'm telling you from, this is not what they taught in school, what I'm about to tell you. Uh, we have always then done a job analysis, we call it. And a job analysis means that you look at people in a job, and, and then we find out what makes people in that job successful and what makes them unsuccessful. And from that, we figure out what the competencies, for, uh, for example, should be in the job, right? Well, no. Uh, 
that's the way we used to do it. And we have done it that way many, many thousand times. Thousands of times. DDI alone has done multiple thousands of job analysis. And we have it all automated even to help do it. And we can collect that. And we still do it for new jobs that are very different or something like that. But we keep coming up with the same competencies. But what makes the competency, so that the differences between the competencies in one company and another company is not the job level, not like vice president or something like that. It is the key actions. How to assure business driver goals are met by linking competencies and personal attributes to business drivers. Remember those business drivers in my chart? That, those, those were the things the company, the CEO, the big, the top of the company, those were the things that they want to accomplish on their job uh, and for their company, for their company. So here's how it works. So you have a business driver. Remember these are the, I'll, I'll give you ex ex examples of all these. And then we turn those into competencies. And then, so then here's a business example of a business driver for a company, and then we can tell you from research what competencies are related to success in this business driver. So these are the competencies, and these are the personality patterns that are related to success if your company wanted to reduce cost. Now, what if your company wants to cultivate in, in, in innovation? This is a business driver, and we know that these are the competencies most related to that, and these are the personality patterns. So then we evaluate your people relative to the competencies and personality patterns. And then we make an algorithm, a mathematical algorithm, and that predicts how what the chance that you will be successful on a business driver. So, for, and then we can give you a chart. How do you think your CEO would react if you could come in with a chart that says, well, our business driver is to reduce control or reduce operating costs. The CEO has said to you, that's what I want. We are losing money. We've got to control costs. We've got to get everybody involved on that. And you can say, well, we're not doing bad. They, the people are good at this. The people up here are good at that. The, this is a, now there's some people here or not, but we, could, we can identify those, but we'll have a pretty good chance of being successful. And we've done that before that in our company. We run into times where we have to reduce cost. But then somebody up in the top of the company says, the reasons that we are not doing well is that we're not innovative. And, and we need the company to cultivate, to, to get more inno innovation in the company. And so then HR, you all, can come back and, and with the same people, it doesn't cost any more money. You've already assessed them, you already have the data, but you put a different formula because the formula for what makes a person innovative isn't the same as what that the person is good at uh, controlling costs. So then you go to your boss and say, I, th I agree with you, Mr. Boss. Of course, you always agree, don't you, with your boss. Uh, you say, I understand why now you want to change one of the big things that we're going to go after. We're going to go after 
being more innovative, and I agree with you. However, we're going to run into a problem here because there are many people, many leaders, managers. These are the managers in the company here. There are many managers in the company that are not very good at bringing out innovation. They don't, they're, they're not very good at that. And so that means we HR people are going to have a special responsibility here. If, if the company is going to go and wants to go in this direction, we're going to have to develop, do a lot of development. We're going to have to really work on, on getting people ready and skilled to, to uh, cultivate uh, innovation. And then, of course, when you are looking for people in the organization, then you can, these are the people down here, those are the drivers. Most organizations, when they pick business drivers, pick no more than five. And they all pick five because uh, they, they can't stop. You know, they, want, they want this, this, and this. So anyway, so those are the drivers. And, uh, and then this is for this person. Blue is good. Green is best. Red's bad. And so that could help you. If you had that information, that could help you uh, get more, uh, make better decisions about people. And even in, in your assessment, and I know most of you uh, have, uh, have gone, have people have gone through assessment, their normal assessment has competencies and it has personality information and it has suggestions of uh, growth areas. But the newer ones relate the individual to the business driver. And so when you're giving feedback to the individual, you're not just saying, well, I think, of course, this competency is important. It's much more powerful if you can say, because he, he or she knows that who, what the business drivers are. And if you can talk to them about why these why this person's skills are important to the business drivers and why the development of some of those skills is important, then you've got a lot more ability to sell. And yeah, an accurate assessment. I'm assuming you have a good assessment center. So we're not going to talk about that, but that's what you need. Uh, but does anybody want to talk about that for a minute? And you know, what it's, you know I'm, I'm sure I'm not totally clear. Yes, please. Um, who should do the assessment according to you? <laughs> I know there are assessment centers. Right. You know, PDI is great at it, but is it the manager who, is, who must be really be capable of doing the assessment for, for their uh, teams, right? Because right. uh, in terms of you know, right. because that, it's a, yeah. that, that's a wonderful question, uh, and that's a very practical question. And uh, uh, did you hear the question? It's who should do the assessment, and it's whoever can do the best job. Now, not obviously, you're not going to put people through an assessment center or acceleration center or uh, or development center, whatever you want to call it. Uh, you're not going to do that every year, you know. Uh, but so you have to give the skills to management to look for cer for certain of the competencies in their evaluation. So in the, in the performance management system and things, you're going to look at competency. A good, I believe, a good performance management system has part of its competencies. So you look at the job in performance management, and then you look at the competencies in performance management, and you need to I improve that system. But it really is built on a, a good, going through a very, very good assessment center to give you the baseline. And then the performance appraisal data can change it. You, just because you get a low rating in an assessment center and something doesn't mean you can't change it. The whole idea 
of what we're going to talk about today of development is to change it, to find, pick areas that are most developable and change it. And so, uh, and, but we don't want in the, in the HR files that's, that someone was low, where now they're not low anymore, they're fine, they're good even. And so you have to have the assessment and the performance management together so that it's up to date and, and working. Is that okay? I ask this question uh, to be able to ask another <laughs> question. Of course. <laughs> sure. um, is it possible to assess someone um, on a set of competencies if you don't have them yourself? If you don't have the competencies? Yeah. Do, is it possible for an assessor or a manager to be able to assess someone else, you know, uh, a group of people or their own teams? if they don't themselves have that competency okay. and they don't, thus they don't have the eye for it or the you know, feel of it. Right, that, that's a very, very good, I have uh, uh, made presentations on this for many, many, many years and no one's ever asked me that question. So you should get some kind of reward for uh, an a excellent question. Uh, I, I believe that, you, that you, you just could not take people off the street and make them a good assessor. But uh, you don't have to be a great, uh, you don't have to be great in something in order to evaluate it. So uh, you, you know that uh, if you are totally interpersonally insensitive, I don't think you're ever going to make a, an assessor. But if you're sort of average and then you're well trained, uh, then we can give you, get you reliability. What the the big change in assessment uh, from the way that we used to do it to how we do it now is all the help that we provide. The, I'm talking about the professional assessors. Uh, we provide them all kinds of help and support and and way the DDI does it and the, for, and the way that they do it for you all is that not one assessor makes the decision. There are three assessors that are making the decision about every competency and that is very, very important. If I were t trying to, to tell you the difference between good assessment and poor assessment, it is how many people are involved. A, if you want to save money on assessment centers, you can go to one uh, person and he will interview the individual and give the person the test or do something and then he has to make the decision. The way, and this is not, this is the way DDI does it, but it are, this is based on all the research, all, all the research is that when human beings make decisions, you, if you get two or three of them together to make the decision and they all are given data and they're all given uh, time, the same amount of time, the decision made by three people together is better than by one person. So that's more of an answer than you wanted but no one has ever asked me that question before, so I want to thank you for that. Is that okay? Is that okay? Yeah, that's okay, thank you. Okay, all right. So, uh, how do you then, uh, my new book is about this, uh, is how do you develop competencies and, uh, uh, quickly? And we I have a, system that everything I, I have to say here I will, is very research based. I'm just saving you from the research. If you read my book, you, you'll find all about it. But the, there are three parts when you are developing your programs in your organizations. I think there are three parts. Uh, and the fur, and, and, the, and this is particularly important in saving time and making it a better experience, training experience for the people. 
Uh, and first is you get them into the right training program, the correct training program. And that's where you use the competencies. So you figure out what competencies the person needs to be developed in, and you get them in a training program for that competency. Where it saves time is then there, you're not spending time training people on competencies that they don't need, and you're training them only on the competencies that they do need. And that's a, it, it's amazing how much money you save if you get the people in the correct training program. And that's done on competencies. That's not what we're talking about here. We're saying that if you have a good assessment system, you not only assess the competencies, but you assess the key actions that are in, in those competencies. So what happens is that your, a company will say, we want to evaluate uh, people on 12, 15 competencies. That's up here. So those, those are defined by the organization relative to the organizational direction. Then we go through an assessment center here, and it comes up with co three competencies that she needs. Okay, and those are the ones that ought to be the focus of your training, right? I mean, it just makes sense. But what we think is then you have to go deeper into something like called key actions, which are subparts of a competency. And every competency has behaviors, and that's the behaviors are what we call key actions. And so then, and I'm sure you've seen this, you have a list of, you should, a good definition of a competency has the key actions under them. And so these are the key actions for the competency delegation. And why is that important? It is important that what if very often this is where they are poor in delegation. They are good at the first two and they are good here, but this is poor. And if you know that, that's going to help the person get a lot more out of their development because you're telling them within the training program they're going into, this is the one you ought to be looking for. You ought to be particularly practicing that. You ought to be particularly uh, being concerned about it. Here, now this one has more. This is making change happen, a competency. And these are the key actions. And you can find that maybe this person never does this, or does, does not this. Do. This is probably the most common one, yeah, those two. And so if you think of it, that if you are going to be trained in something, and before I send you the training program, I sit you down and I tell you why this competency is so important to the company, and how these, this particular competency is related to the business drivers of our company. And if you get better in this competency, you are going to be better at the business drivers, and that will make you more popular at the top of the organization, because that means you're going, you've got the skills to do the things that the organization wants. And then I say, now when you get in that training program, you're going to learn, this is what you're going to learn in the training program. But there's from our research, or from the assessment center, we find out that these two are the ones that you don't do so well in. This is a weaker area. So we want you to pay, pay particular attention to that. And in class, ask questions about it. And in, if you have a skilled practice in the class, then you ask 
to be the person that volunteers to practice and get feedback and, and things. And there's lots of research that shows that if you're focusing on learning something, you learn it a lot better than if you just generally. So when, you, when you're trained in this, you get trained in everything. And you hopefully will get developed on everything. But you will get faster, better development if you've focused that development on a few areas that you happen to be particularly weak on. So that's, that's the whole idea of it. And so, so we, now then we've added something down here, the key actions. So the result of the assessment then is that you have further defined where you should spend your time and energy, where you should ask for help from other people. You know that uh, I, when we have a practice of a, of a skill, uh, I might start off and I'd say, you know, the, the key actions that I'm trying to accomplish is listening and responding with empathy. And so I'd really appreciate you and my group when it's my turn to present, if, if you'll watch out, do I do this and give me feedback on it. And so that's the whole idea. For, so first, the, the idea was that you assess the people to get the right demand, uh, competency and the right uh, key actions, okay? Then, then you have growth opportunity and then you have to acquire it. How, how do you train people? And believe it or not, a lot of managers have no idea how you tra develop people. Maybe you do know that. But I, I have so many times been having, I would give someone an assessment feedback about a person. And, and the person would have lots of strengths, but would have a big weakness in, a, in some area. Their, their, their ability to, uh, to uh, uh, command attention and to uh, get people to follow them and to, uh, uh, to, uh, to, to change people's attitudes, that was low. And, so what, and I, we talked to, I, I'm talking to his boss or his boss's boss, and the boss says, I, you're right, that's his problem. That's, that's the first thing they say. And the second thing they say, I've got just the way to, to train him. I've got a group of people in the organization who are impossible to work for, work with. And I'm going to put him in that situation and he can learn it there. And what have you done? You've fixed, put him in a situation for a huge uh, failure experience. Uh, and that's what we don't want. That's what happens if you don't uh, uh, tr do training. You have to, you have to assess. You have to give people skills so that they ha can then practice successfully. People cannot learn to be leaders just by putting them in leadership jobs. That we prove that every day. We prove that. We have all these leaders out there. They're not getting any better just by practice. You've got to have something more than practice. Someone mentioned to me an analogy that uh, I sometimes use, and I'll give it to you. Uh, and that is that uh, in if you went into a doctor with an ailment uh, and he just talked to you and he said, you don't have a problem or take this pill, you wouldn't think that that was a very good doctor, would you? Uh, and so, but what if the doctor would give you a lot of tests and maybe give you an x-ray to see what your problem is. And you would think that's a better doctor because he's getting better information about you to make the uh, diagnosis. 
And so the old days that we determined what people needed to be trained in and who needed to be trained, it was like the doctor who just talked to you. Now we're more modern and we put people through uh, an assessment center or an acceleration center, whatever you want to call it. And that gives us, it's like an x-ray. But the thing that I'm talking about is an MRI machine. You know what an MRI is? That's when they look down at the cellular level of you know, to get a better diagnosis. And that's what we're talking about in, in terms of assessment because the competencies are sort of the x-ray level. But if you really want to get down to what the problem is that you're going to try to fix, the MRI, and not always of course, but many times the MRI gives you a more detailed focus on what the problem is so you can go after it. And that's exactly what I'm trying to get you to do. That, that you need to, when you're looking at the people here in Assess, you need to look at them at the MRI level. And that's, that's so that's that. And then you want to then help them acquire the uh, skills that they need. And uh, and we and they in, in acquiring, we very much believe many of you are our customers uh, in behavior modeling. That and we believe that you train people in behavioral skills by modeling. So what you do is you talk to them about why what they need to be trained in and why it's important. And that all happens after this. And then they get up here and we tell them the behavior that they need to uh, model, that they need to improve. And we give them practice uh, doing it. And we show them a video and then we give them practice. And that's all part of the acquire. And that's part of the learning, behavior modeling and coaching and observation. That's what happens when you go to a DDI training program. You get, get those things. It is exactly like learning a skill, a, a, a sport. If, if uh, you come to me and you want to improve your tennis, and, well, and I'm the coach, do I just say, okay, go out and play tennis. You, and eventually, in, in 50 years, you may get to be better. But that's not an efficient way of training people. That's a huge waste. What you need to do is the coach will probably, so, so hit the ball with me, and he will diagnose what you need to learn, where you, what parts of tennis you're good at. Maybe your serve is great but your backhand is bad. And so, haha, that's what he's doing here. He's assessing and he's saying, you're, we're going to talk about, you're going to practice all the swings in tennis, but we're going to particularly work on your backhand. And let's work on that. And we're going, he, he'll show you how to hold the racket better, how to watch where your feet are when you're standing, how to get ready, and so forth, and he will point this out and demonstrate it. That's the behavior modeling part. And then he will get back there and he'll hit easy balls to you so you can practice the part that you need to practice. And then you get better and he hits it harder and you get better and he hits it harder. And then, then he starts to play tennis with you. And, but he always watches the backhand and you watch the backhand. It's called deliberate practice. And there are lots of books written about it. And you know that the famous example are the Beatles, that supposedly the way they got so good was they were very, very good in deliberate practice. Every time they did a song, they did the whole song, but they had decided they were going to particularly practice a part of it 
to make that part better. And there's a book written about how they use that technology to get to be as good as the Beatles were. So anyway, that's what you would do. And then, so you practice with a coach, and then pretty much, then you go, uh, then, then you get somebody to play with, and you practice with them, and they give you feedback, and all the time you're watching on the part you're trying to improve. Someone asked me, uh, is it possible to change? And my answer was, with difficulty. <laughs> there, there are some things that's easy, of course, but lots of things that you most want to change on people, the things that are holding them back from being great in their company are hard to change. And many of them are personality variables, but they are changeable. They are if you work at it, but you've got to really focus on it. That's, that's the whole idea of behavior modeling. So in the acquire, there's two parts of that. What's the purpose of acquiring? Uh, it is to get people good enough so they can go out and try it on the job and, and have a good sense of success. That's it. So how do you do that? You learn it, and you can learn it not, not just in a DDI program. <laughs> you can learn it, you know, a, a good coach can, can help you learn it. But it's then coached practice. Coach, you know, where practice that has a coach in a room or a coach who helps you get ready for, it's, say, a meeting with somebody, and then who debriefs you after the meeting and you go over it. So that's all part of acquiring. So if you, you do these things, Together, you're going to do this, and then you do this, and that is acquiring. People, some people think that just taking the DDI program or whatever program, then you go right out and you're, you're great, you know, you're, you can do anything. And that's not the way, right? What the, the way to do it is the first time you try the new skills that you're, you're going to do, you get somebody to help prepare you, that you can check out what your plan is. If you, if you have a, uh, if you've written out a plan, a discussion planner, I believe, you, you, you use the discussion planners, right? How many people use the discussion planners? In, or a few, well, I personally believe that the best thing you can do is to use a discussion planner. And what that is, is uh, to think that forces you to think through how the discussion is going to go, how you're going to open it, how you're going to bring out the issues, what, what kind of response, what do you think are the areas that, the, the, how you think your person is going to respond, how will you, you, how will you deal with that. All those things, you can think it through. And, and if you have a good boss, or a good friend, you can go over your plan with them and say, and they can give you feedback before you do it, and then you do it, and then you can discuss it. And if you have a discussion planner, you can say, this worked well and this worked poorly. I, they don't cost anything. Uh, they're, they're, it's the best thing you can do for a new person. Now, you don't do it after every time in your life. I'm talking about the first time you use a new skill on the job, you do that. That's still part of the learning part. The learning part is to get good enough so that you're, you're okay, you know. Uh, and so I highly recommend that as, uh, as a system. Uh, uh, or you could do, a, you can have a professional coach if you're high enough in the organization. That you, uh, we deal with, we have a lot of people who work for us who do professional coaching. The coach does the same thing one-to-one -one as we do in the training program. The coach is pushing the president of the company to do, to do things that he knows he should do, to face up to somebody, to make a tough decision. He knows that his European representative is not good, 
and he's complaining about it all the time. But the coach gets him to take action because the coach prepares him for that interaction with the person he's going to have to talk to to take him out of this job. And people, you know, you think the CEO's confident, they know everything. They're not. They're scared to death on a lot of these things. And that's what a coach can do is to help. But in all the, and sometimes you can do it by observation, very seldom. But sometimes if you go to enough people making presentations and you can learn tricks, you know, what, what do good people do and poor people don't do. And that's learning from observation. But that's not usually, and the problem with that is that you learn the wrong things. Over and over again, we have people who uh, are excellent managers, but they do something very wrong. They're very sarcastic. You know, they make jokes at people. But they're so interpersonally good, and they've got so many other positives that everybody doesn't, nobody cares. I mean, it's just one little thing. But if you watch that person, inevitably what you remember is being sarcastic. And then so you start being sarcastic, and you don't have all the other skills. So, uh, so I don't believe in it too much, but it is part of this. But this is the important part, and that's what we fail to do, is to don't think that going to a DDI program or any other training program is the end. It is just the beginning. And, and that's when you need this coach practice. Okay? Then you get to the third one is apply. And there's, the way, reason this goes over here is sometimes you know, that people have the strength. You don't need to teach them, but they just don't ever have an opportunity to apply it. And that's what we run into with people who are, uh, we think are high potentials. We'll think of somebody who, who we think has lots of leadership skills, but they've never ever had a real leadership job. And that is the number one reason why people don't get promoted to top jobs. I, I tell you for sure, I know this, over thousands of organizations. That is that we've got somebody who has everything needs to be a senior person in the organization, but he or she has never really had a line management job. He, he's always come up in the, he's a scientist, he's always been in that side of the business, or he's a lawyer, he's this or that, and he's never ever run a big organization. And so almost always the board of directors will choose somebody who's not as good, but who has had experience. And so your job is to get the people into the job, into situations where they can prove themselves. That's the number one job of succession management. The number one job is to get people into jobs where they can show what they can do. And that assumes, though, that they know how to do it. But don't put them in those jobs if they don't. If they don't, which is the more common situation, then you give them the skills and then you put them in the job. So that's the, the whole system that we're going after. Uh, and there you apply what you've learned up here and so forth, okay? So it can go from here to here, but most of it, almost 99% of the time it goes around. And these are different uh, ways that in applying on the job, you can use uh, peer pressure. Now with social media, you, you can have a coach, a personal coach who lives a thousand miles away, that, that you can have people who were in the training program with you that you can keep tab, tabs with through social media. Uh, that's the learning cohort. Uh, and then you have need an individual development plan. 
uh, about how you're going to, once when you come out of the training program, you need to have a de development plan, how you're going to apply it, how you're going to get started and how you're going to keep up and how you're going to measure your success. That the big trick is to figure out, it doesn't have to be scientific. It could just be, at, at, once a month you ask people uh, who report to you, how am I doing in terms of asking more questions before I tell you the answer? You know, that's a big problem with a lot of managers. They're so bright that they hear a problem and they tell you the answer, right? And that's not what the people want. They, the people want you, the manager to seek more information and to hopefully draw the answer from them. And so we can teach somebody to do it, but it's easy to, to slip back to the old way of doing it. And so if you could make it, make it, you openly say to the people who work for you, I've decided that this is a problem of mine. And everybody will say, yeah, yeah, it is. And then, you say, I, and then I say, and I need your help. So once a month, I'm just going to give you a little form and you give me some feedback. Don't, don't sign it or anything. Just to, or I can count, if, if I'm trying to uh, be better at delegating, usually you can tell how good you are at delegating by how many times you have to tell the person again what to do. <laughs> you know, if you, a good delegation has it all done. You know, it's just, do you, uh, you understand what you're going to have to do and you know how to measure it. You, you, I tell you when I want a report and everything. Well, if I, ha if I delegate to you and then a week later you come in and you say, I still don't understand what I'm supposed to do, and I tell you again, and then a week later you come in again, that's not a good delegation. And so you can get, just keep track of that. So you don't have to have big scientific things. And in our new book, we have pages and pages of examples of how you can set up these informal measurements, but it is necessary to try. It's the trying of it that counts. It doesn't, because that means you're focusing on it. Because if you're trying to measure it, even if it's not exactly perfect measurement, it's better than no measurement. And that's, that's the direction that uh, we're, we are going into. I have to say one more thing. How many people here use individual development plans? About everybody, right? It's, it's the most common thing in HR. Well, there are some individual development plans that are good. Some are, the good ones are the behavioral ones. But I have a piece of research that, uh, that I think is extremely important. Uh, that, and this is in our new book. Uh, that if you, if you take people who fill out a, a development action plan and people who don't, the people who fill out the form, write out the form, are three times more likely to change their behavior than the people who don't write out a form. And again, it's not magic, it's just making you focus, you're thinking the development action form forces you to think through the development process, and so you're more likely than to do it. And so uh, I just think that's so important. It's such an easy thing to do. A lot of people uh, give it right after a training program. And that's good and bad. It's a good to get it started. A good development action plan, a person takes, he tries to fill it out, fills it out, but then takes that plan to the boss and gets some feedback from the boss and gets the boss to, to cooperate with him. Many development, we have what happens all the time in leadership training, which we're into, we train somebody in leadership skills. Now, for them to have any learning, they've got to be a leader. They've got to have somebody to lead, but maybe they're not in a job where they got anybody to lead. So they ought to go to their boss and he'll put them to it, make a 
maybe there's a special team. He can have them lead that. He, the boss can help them get a situation where they can practice. And so a good development action plan puts, puts the best thinking of the individual with the best thinking of the boss. And together, they, they, and they both sign it. And that's all. No one, personnel, sometimes personnel collects them because they try to get measurement of what they're doing. But it's the idea of it that works. So we have, I'm going to go through this very fast because we don't have, but uh, right now we've been talking about uh, putting people into programs as they need it. So we get one person from this department, one person from this department, one person from that department, and they come into a training program because they all have common needs, right? Uh, and so that's a very, very good way. Uh, but it doesn't provide the ongoing reinforcement on the job that you might want. So, and you have all these ways of creating a learning environment. And it's a big puzzle. And so how do you create an environment that will be more conducive to learning? And the answer to that is a learning journey. That's just a name we've come up with. That, but the, the big thing is uh, it's designed for a cohort and it takes people through a series of events with the same group. So maybe you have 30 people who have a need of a, a development, of a competency, and you, you treat them as, they, uh, as a team, sort of, and they interact with each other and they become friends with each other, but much more directly than if you just put people in a, in a training program, you get to know people, but you don't have a purpose in mind where in these learning journeys you do. So now I'm sure you can read all this, and uh, I, I'm not going to bother to go through it. But here, here are uh, it's a three day. There's three days in session one. This is a senior program. Three days in challenges, mastering EQ, influencing courage. But before they get there, they've all had background and they've had they had coaching about these. And then they have a meeting after this. Uh, with the coach, their boss, and the mentor, each person. Then they go into what's called action learning. And action learning is they, the team, say 30 people, take on a project, a re, often the best real project in the team, in the company. And they use, and the project is, use, is selected so they can use these skills and give, give each other feedback. And then they may have a developmental assignment with other activities. And then there's another session where they learn other new skills. And then they have another action learning and more coaching. And, action. and so the company, the big thing is, we, we call this a map, a learning journey map. And all it is is getting the company and the people who are being developed committed to a process. It, it, and, and, and encourage them as a group to, to f support each other, which all is good. Anytime you can get 30 managers from your companies that all support each other, that is good, I guarantee you. So, so we, we present this map to the people. This is what you're going through. You're not just going to a event a training program. You're going to go start a journey and it goes over time, six months or more. And it's got measurement at the end and things. And so uh, this is very popular in America. And I, I, I wish I could uh, give you a lot more about it, uh, uh, but the, you, you get it. And this, this is a more complicated one to even has networking 
meetings in it and so forth. So, okay, now, uh, the, uh, one of the things that a lot of you talked about uh, were uh, high potentials. Should, there, there, we get big arguments on the question. Uh, should you have a group of people who you treat as high potentials, or should you treat everybody the same in terms of development? You, give, you, you can make a strong argument. What you do is you develop everybody, and then the best will the ones that arise. Uh, or do you try to make a very educated guess who the high potentials are and focus just focus particular training on those. You still train everybody for their job, but it's okay. How many people vote for being very democratic and treating everybody the same? Okay, well, you're right. That's the right answer. <coughs> you can't. You can't. You can't afford it. The big thing that you cannot afford is there's only a few jobs, even in huge companies, huge companies, there are only a few jobs that will really be great learning experiences. Great, you know, uh, that change of life kinds of things. You don't want to put somebody who's poor in the, or who has no future in the organization in those jobs. You want to save those jobs for the people who be, get the most out of it. And that's why uh, you need high potentials. And you can't We've got these fancy training programs that are much more expensive. You don't want to put people in there who are not going to benefit from it and things. So uh, this is all in my old book, and I'll go through it in one minute or less. But you have to understand we, that the whole idea of a high potential pool is an old one. That has been around forever. But the old days that they, you sort of graduated into it, or the ones who came from the best university got in the pool or something, and you stayed there for a couple of years or five years, and then you went out. Nothing really happened to you, and uh, it uh, was just nothing. And we, we did my old book, the book you're going to get, uh, we did a big study, a worldwide study of how many people got senior jobs out of the pool. How many people who were graduates of the pool got the senior jobs? And it was the same percentage as everybody else. So there, there was no benefit. They were making decisions for senior jobs without regard to who was in the pool because they didn't think they learned anything in the pool. That's not what we're talking about here. This is a very, very different kind of pool. And I'll uh, tell you some of it. And if you have a really big organization, you can have a pool uh, that uh, in subsidiaries and then one for the top of the organization. So what, what is it? Uh, first, as I said before, all leaders get training to do a better job, their own job, to training for the next level. So you don't change that. You, still, you treat everybody that fairly, but the people in the acceleration pool get the assignments with the greatest learning opportunities and visibility. They spend less time in training. One of the big things that you, you only have a little bit of time to train. After someone learns something, you've got to take them out of that job and put them in another job where they're going to learn other things. That's so hard for management to do because they're just starting to make money. They're starting to, to, to really be good, and then we pull them out of that job and put them in another job. But that's what you have to do if you're going to prepare people for the top. These acceleration pools are accelerating people for top positions. Uh, we give them what's called stretch assignments. That means really hard assignments where they're really going to have to show all kinds of skills. Uh, they get more training and development. They get development. They're evaluated every six months about how they're going. Doing uh, no guarantee of promotion. 
that they have to succeed in every job. It's not one that it used to be in the old days if you just sort of, no one, you didn't do anything and no one did anything to you, you finally got promoted, you know. Uh, now here you have to show all the way, every step, you have to prove yourself. Uh, and you can enter, and this is very important. This is particularly important for, for women. <coughs> that in the old days, if you had a, a promotion pool, a high potential pool, you only got in at the bottom at a certain age or a certain level, like second level management. They would decide who's in the pool, but that, that's it. Well, but there are many people who are what we call slow bloomers. They bloom late. They're like a flower that doesn't bloom at, at the time the other flowers do, but if you have patience, it'll bloom and it'll be prettier than the other flowers, maybe. And there are a lot of women who have babies and that keeps them from being as active in, uh, as good for the pool, but they can come in so that any time you can get in the pool at any level. Now, and that's a very, very important concept because it, that it just makes it so much more flexible because people just seem like average employees and then when they get to middle management, they blossom and they, they just are, they really show. And so we say, oh, great, we're gonna put her in the pool. And because being in the pool just allows you to have faster movement in the organization to get through all the steps. When, when you get, when you're up, I, I sit with all kinds of CEOs looking down at his or, his or her organization. And they say, I don't have people ready. And he's not talking about he, that they don't have the right competencies. He's talking about they don't have the right experience. Because he wants everybody, if you're going to be at this level, the top, you better have international experience. And you've got somebody who's just great, but she's never been out of Turkey. And so she's not considered promotable for this job. And so what the acceleration pool does is to be sure that you do get those promotion, those, those assignments, and you do get the, the background that you need. Uh, now, this is very, very important. Uh, and this is what you this is not, the acceleration pool is not the job of the HR department. It will not work if HR is doing all this stuff. This has to be done by the senior people in the organization. And HR manages it, they control it, they produce the material that they are considering. But if management doesn't own it, they won't, it won't work. Because you have to make hard decisions. Uh, that's the identification of high potentials. Because everybody asks me that, it's one of my most common questions. Can you give me a test that will tell me who the high potentials are? And I look them in the eye and I say, no, there is no test that will tell you who the high potentials are. And anybody who says there is a test is wrong. Now they can take some tests that will help you maybe identify some possibilities and things, but, but really there's none. But I have a bigger reason for saying that than, than I, that. so, okay, what is, but first we have to be sure we understand what is high potential or leadership potential period, what is it? Because it is the most misunderstood thing in our business, in the HR business, because people totally confuse what it means. Because it, it is the likelihood of an individual can grow or will grow into a successful leader in a role with significantly expanded leadership responsibilities. That's what potential means. Potential means that the person is going to go two levels or more up 
sometimes for the acceleration pool, we're saying this person has the potential to be a senior manager in the organization. But potential, in our definition, is potential for a, senior, for a higher job. It's not, the thing that confuses people, is that it's not performance. That's the worst one. If we take <coughs> a very, very good salesperson and make him a manager, we often lose a good salesperson and get a poor manager. The competencies are different. The competencies of running, uh, being a first level supervisor are significantly different than the competencies needed for higher management. And so just because a person is good at their current job does not make them high potential. Now, it's good. And if they're not good, then we wouldn't probably carry, care for them. So it's a negative predictor that if you're poor at first level supervisor, I guarantee you we're not going to look to you for to go higher. But just because you are good at a first level supervisor's job doesn't mean you're going to have high potential. And the other thing is readiness. People take the easy answer. You know, this, the boss quits. She's been in the job for years. You know, we're going to give her the job. She's ready. She knows everybody, does everything you know, and everything. But is, does that make her really have potential for higher management? And if that job is a stepping stone for higher management, then that's maybe not a good, good thing. So those are the two uh, uh, things that cause problems that are negative. OK, so I'm going to tell you what DDI thinks about this and what we do ourselves. Uh, incidentally, every, uh, one thing about our company is that we are unbelievably conscientious of doing everything to ourselves that we preach to others. I guarantee you. And our company, for example, is going through a big management change because a lot, there were a number of people who uh, start, helped me start the company years ago, and then where everybody's retiring. And, and uh, so we are, but we are ready. I guarantee you, we are the most ready uh, company you've ever seen for uh, succession because we have one of these ex succession acceleration pools, and we've had it for years and years and years, and we've developed all these people, and we're ready uh, to fill the jobs. One of the points about the acceleration pool that uh, I do need to tell you is that people used to pretend that you had replacements planned. So they used to have a replacement planning book. And if she quits, then he's going to take her place, and she's going to take his place, and they'd have these books. And no one ever paid. They paid a lot of money for them. HR kept busy filling out the pages. Nobody paid any attention to them in the actuality. And so in the acceleration pool, we don't aim people at a particular job. We aim people at a level. Because they, it's amazing how people change to go into this part of the company and that part and so forth. So, so we're aiming at a level, OK? Uh, so what, what do we, we, here's what we do very quickly, is that we have top management pick the people in the pool. But we give them a lot of help. We give them a, uh, a uh, we, and they basically think, get nominees. And you know, who, who, who, who have you heard is good? And they go down the organization and they come up with some nominees. And then we uh, have a, uh, then we in, very conscientiously, the members of top management interview these people. Or most of them, they, they, you pick people to deal with them who know the people. But they don't interview them for a job. They just find out about them. And they have to rate them on leadership pro promise. Uh, uh, per, uh, personal development orientation, balance of values and results, and mastery of complexity. 
Now they are all well, good performers, so we're not playing around with poor performers, but that's what DDI thinks is uh, high potential factors. These are the hard to measure sort of uh, developmental kinds of things that people who are really motivated for it and things. And so we have a grading system that, the, uh, that we don't just have top management, but some, we get three people who know the people well, evaluate these things, and then, then we have a little computer system that puts them all together. The top management then looks at them, and top management makes the decision about who gets in the pool. And why is that important is then top management is going to have to put a lot of money on these people, it's going to train them, it's going to move them around and everything. And if they don't have ownership of it, if they didn't have a part of it, then they're not going to put up the money, they're not going to make the tough decisions. If, if you have a wonderful test and you're the P CEO and I bring that to you and say, here's the high potential people in your company, he's going to say, thank you very much, Bill, and he's going to go off and do what he wants and puts the people he knows in there, which are not necessarily the best people. That is, you can have a test that will inform, that will help Get, get some ideas about strengths and weaknesses in a certain area. But we don't, the, the problem with, there are out there in the world high potential tests. But when you do that, you are inevitable, you are then telling people you were considered for high potential, as high potential, but you didn't make it. Most of the people are going to get that message because those are the people who take the test and then they say, well, I flunked the test. I'm, I'm not high potential. She, she is and, and everything. So we don't tell the people that they're being considered. We uh, collect data from people who know them, and we, people that, you know, management people who we can trust. And then we have a real target selection-like discussion, and we deal with behavior. And sometimes we'll say, we don't have enough behavior in this area, so let's put this person in another job so we can collect some behavior to be sure that they're okay there, and then we'll put them in the pool. We do that often. And so it, what I'm suggesting, and I know you're going to say this is hard, but what I'm suggesting is that you would have a, uh, you, you, you make this a management thing that management's proud of, and they brag about the system. And it doesn't take that much time. It takes, when, once you get them trained, it takes them a little time to train top management. Once you get them trained, they can do it in half an hour. And that is a small price to pay to get good people in this pool because that's where the top future of the company is going to come from. I only have one more. That's what they do. Uh, you remember I showed you one more thing and I'm done. Uh, we talked about business drivers and how that related to the success profile. Remember, right at the beginning? And that's how we decided. And that, uh, well, there's a big new trend, uh, and it really is big. Uh, I just, before I left, I found out that 50% of our new management training, not supervisory training, but new management training programs are, <clears throat> are chosen in a different way uh, and because they go from the business drivers to the training and they skip all this. Now that doesn't mean that they don't get the success profile on the people and it doesn't mean they don't use that in training. But it means that if you have a Okay, this uh, cultivate, remember this situation where they, they are trying to change your business driver. They haven't been very innovative in the past, and now management says, we got to be more innovative. That's where the competition's doing. We got to be more innovative. So, they, so that's the business driver. And they look at their chart, and they find there's a lot of people that need to be developed. In, in, how, in how to be 
a manager that supports innovation. We're not training them on innovation. It's making a, an environment that will support in innovation. Okay, so management then says, okay, we're going to train all the managers on supporting innovation. They don't bother about the competency. We still, when we train them, they still get competency profiles and they still get all this stuff, but the focus of the thing, and management can understand this better. I mean, you know, if you ask for money to run more leadership training programs, they may give you the money or they may not, but if you say, look, here's your situation. You've got two choices. Either we change the culture of the organization by training, by developing some wonderful leadership training programs for managers that deals with, with innovation. If we don't do it, there's no chance of us moving the dial. We're just kidding ourselves. Management will say, go ahead, spend the money. And so that's, the, I said, 50% of our customers at higher management levels are doing that. I, and it's hard for me to explain because we still get the key actions and we still help them with all those things, but the sort of the overwrapping uh, thrust of it is that we're, we're helping, we're going directly to the key action. So I'm sorry, I'm getting a bit over time. Thank you so much, and I'm going to be around. If anybody wants to come talk to me, come please do. Thanks a lot. <laughs>